For the Investing News Network from the Lyft Show in Toronto, I'm Brian McGovern, here today with Greg Engel, CEO of Organigram. Greg, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me today. Greg, uh, I just want to talk a little bit first about the listing in the U.S. Obviously, that's a big accomplishment for the company. Tell me a little bit about the road to getting there, and also now that you have this listing in the NASDAQ, what's sort of the biggest thing for you personally uh, now that you have it? Well, we have been seeing a, a big shift in our investment base and a lot of interest of the U.S. So uh, last year, we were the number four traded stock on the QX on the OTC. Um, and we knew, though, from meeting with a number of different funds that uh, had interest in Organogram, wanted to invest in the company, that they weren't able to invest in us unless we were listed on a you know major listing in the NASDAQ or the NICE. So uh, for us, that was really the incentive um, to go up to the NASDAQ to give us broader exposure to this uh, ever-growing, more traditional investor base, right? And we're seeing that where... Uh, larger, more traditional funds are entering the space. So by going to the NASDAQ, it gives us access to those funds, gives them an ability to now um, you know, invest in us as a company and participate in uh, part of our ownership group. So it's exciting. One thing that we've heard uh, of that's very unique about the investment market in the, in the cannabis space is that a lot of retail investors have been the first ones to get in and it's still been a dominant force. But like you mentioned, a lot of these institutions are starting to come in as well. How do you balance those conversations when you reach out to retail investors and now that you're saying connecting more with institutionals? Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, certainly this industry is built on the backs of um, both uh, retail investors predominantly as well as hedge funds uh, who really funded the industry in the early days. And, you know, retail investors are still a major part and a critical part of our investment strategy. And I think, um, you know, the approach to go to the NASDAQ was about diversification and adding to that. But I think it also gives uh, retail investors more liquidity as well, right? So just an opportunity to participate as well, uh, and that's been a big part of it. So I think, you know, the messaging to them the same is we're building a long-term fundamental business here, um, you know, being the only company that's had three consistent uh, quarters of positive adjusted EBITDA and kind of our, our, our uh, whole approach about long-term sustainability uh, is a message that's resonated well both with retail investors and about uh, with institutional funds as well. Mentioning, you mentioned the results. Uh, that is something that we've seen in the past few quarters here in Canada now that legalization is open. And we've seen a lot of sentiment downgraded for the Canadian cannabis companies. Uh, yourself, Organigram, has been able to operate at what some would even call an undervalued position. Uh, is that something that has been a benefit for you in terms of like the expectations versus the reality of what the Canadian market has been so far in operation, your stock as well? Well, I think it, uh, there's two factors that have impacted. One is that, um, you know, what we saw in the past is a lot of uh, investment decisions were being made on um, a funded capacity, right? That was the buzzword in the space, and it was what was going to be your funded capacity. But what we've subsequently seen to that is a lot of challenges. Companies have had production challenges, particularly the large greenhouse producers, in terms of meeting their, uh, you know, what they had said their uh, funded capacity would look like. Um, and then secondly, is now that we are on, you know, in the cycle of kind of reproducibility in our indoor facility, I mean, the entire industry, other than a few players uh, like ourselves, went with large greenhouses. So our approach of going with, uh, you know, an only and large indoor facility was focused on quality, but our kind of ability to produce and propagate in that environment, as well as the systems we have to support it, have led us to actually producing at the lowest cost of any of the publicly reported, uh, publicly reporting companies. And I think, you know, that's been, I wouldn't say it's been a surprise to people, but it has gone against the whole premise of how a lot of companies have foundationally built their business, right? So we knew that we could continue to have improvements in costing and by improving yields, and that's been really one of our biggest drivers. But it's also about how much automation you have in your downstream and how efficient you are as a processor. So, so I think it's been a combination of um, you know, are, are not overstating what our potential results would be and then being in a position to deliver on those results which investors have appreciated. I see. Another factor that it feels like that's been uh, leading to some of the downgraded sentiment in the Canadian market has been the emergence of the U.S. space as well. Uh, what's, what's your position when it comes to talking with investors and what investors are saying and it feels like, like I said, the sentiment is moving down towards the U.S., a lot of these multi-state operator companies and for Organigram, how do you view that potential market entry in the future? Yeah, so two questions there. I think one is that, you know, when we look at kind of, uh, I think we are seeing a, a, a shift in terms of investors um, to some degree as more opportunities have opened up in the U.S. Um, you know, a number of companies have done RTOs on the CSE in Canada and, that, and on the NEO as well. Um, and uh, so certainly there's been a, a broader range of names, right? 
But what you're still seeing is consistently that the larger companies, the companies that are delivering like ourselves, um, still have strong investor support. So I think where the separation is happening is um, you know, between kind of the, the, the larger consistent providers like Organogram uh, and some of the smaller companies. And those companies are really, in Canada, are, are really struggling to access capital now. So, so that kind of capital basis um, you know, for them has become a lot more challenging. And I think for the U.S. market, um, you know, we all look at the U.S. market as such a, a, you know, a significant part of the global market. And our, our strategy in terms of, look, we're not operating and we're never going to operate in a jurisdiction where we don't have full regulatory clearance and guidance. You know, as a TSXV traded company and as a NASDAQ traded company, we have to ensure that's the case. And also, as a company, we follow regulations. But we are certainly actively right now, for example, looking at, you know, there is tremendous opportunity in Europe in the CBD marketplace. Uh, so we're looking at that. We've already invested in a Serbian hemp company, Heavy Anna, which traded on the CSE. And we're following the U.S. to look at as this evolution. I mean, certainly, um, you know, there are opportunities in CBD right now in the U.S. And I think, uh, you know, still the FDA public hearings that were held last Friday certainly would indicate that there's still a lot of uncertainty there. But we did get some clarity on a few things, right, in terms of, um, you know, what is going to be under more scrutiny and not under scrutiny. And I think food and beverage products in the near term are under a lot of scrutiny and under, from the FDA. But there are going to be CBD opportunities. So we're, you know, we're looking at, okay, is there an opportunity to enter the market uh, in the CBD market in particular for us right now? You mentioned specifically that CBD market that has become quite a boom in the U.S. We've seen established pharmacies start to carry these products. How do you balance that willing and that need to want to enter this market with products that you feel comfortable maybe starting to produce as soon as possible? You're starting to see some competitors in the Canadian space move forward with plans there as well. And like I said, when, when established retailers are already selling it, how do you balance that with waiting for FDA guidance or waiting for more regulation? Well, I think you have to look at, you know, um, so again, we, we have to wait for regulatory certainty, but you have to also look at kind of what's the future hold. And so part of our strategy to date has, uh, we're one of only two licensed producers that have an investment in biosynthesis. Um, and so that investment in Hyacinth to us is a disruptive technology in the future where you're going to be able to produce uh, uh, major and minor cannabinoids through biosynthesis. And, you know, the ability to do that at a fraction of the cost of plant drive, whether or not that's outdoor hemp or whether or not that's indoor grown or greenhouse grown cannabis, is going to be a big differentiator when you're looking to enter those marketplaces. So, um, you know, ultimately, Hyacinth will be in a position in early 2020 to have their first commercial batches of CBD and THC available. Um, and our investment in them is really looking towards the future because in the future, um, you know, you can see where a, a biosynthesis, because, you know, biosynthesis with yeast fermentation is how the majority of the world's insulin supply comes from, um, you know, many vitamins come this way, ASA for aspirin comes this way. It's proven technology and uh, hyacinth has been working for over four years to really develop methodologies, proprietary enzymes and yeast strains to produce not only CBD and THC, but now minor cannabinoids as well. So part of our strategy is being able to leverage that to produce a pure form, which lends itself to more kind of certainty in terms of product deliverability in the, in the future. So, And as a last thing, Greg, I just want to ask you, what are some of your top corporate goals for the company as we look ahead into the second half of 2019? Yeah, for us, I mean, we've been preparing for the last um, 18 months plus for Rec 2.0 here in Canada. So certainly the derivative-based market. Uh, earlier today, we announced uh, with PAX that we're partnering with PAX on their PAX era technology. We're, we'll be one of four Canadian providers um, for the PAX pods uh, in terms of filling them and, and being part of that partnership with them. And, you know, we invest in technology. And so uh, as a company, PAX is a partner, which is a proven leader in vaporizer technology, uh, not only in terms of their their um, delivery platform, but also their, online, their uh, app and how that uh, works for customers is a huge technology. So we're great and excited about partnering with them. But we've also already invested. We see chocolates on the edible side as a leading category. Uh, we've already announced we've uh, purchased one of the leading chocolate lines in the world for $15 million, and we'll have that operational before the end of the year to start be producing that category. And, you know, our, our approach is, you know, when we go into a segment, we want to have a, a strong uh, key position in it. We want to have this broad diversification and have a little bit of each category. We want to have a dominant, and that's why we've chosen chocolates, and we'll be announcing some others in the, in the future. So, but I think also for us, you know, we need to continue to do more internationally, and that's one thing that uh, we're continuing to evaluate and look at opportunities. Greg, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Brian. Great for having me. For the Investing News Network from the Lyft Expo Show in Toronto, I'm Brian McGovern. See you next time.